Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have a terrific show today, a rare one, in that John Towie and Ruth Elliott will read prose from their memoirs. John will read first, and then Ruth. John Towie has made his living as an actor for the past 50 years, a veteran of Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater, television, and film. He is a graduate of the Goodman School of Drama in Chicago with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. He worked as an actor for three seasons each at Arena Stage in Washington, D.C., the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, and the Public Theater in New York City. Since moving to L.A. in 1990, he has guest starred in 30 television shows and a couple of films. John has been a member of the Great Quill Society at MPTF for the past three years. The memoir essay he will read is from an autobiogra autobiography which he's working on. Here's a superb writer, John Towie. Thanks, Harry. Um, I'm going to read two pieces. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take, maybe half an hour, um, maybe not quite. The first one's going to be on the great poet Richard Wilbur, and it goes like this. On July 5th, 1986, the Statue of Liberty, which had been closed for repairs for the previous two years, was reopened to the public and rededicated. A few, few weeks earlier, Life magazine had a photograph of the statue on its cover. I bought a copy, and when I opened it, there was a poem on the inside cover written by Richard Wilbur. It was only 16 lines of a longer poem called On Freedom's Ground. But the 16 lines I'd like to do for you now, which propelled me into this long 20-year correspondence I had with Richard Wilbur, these lines uh, uh, called uh, On Freedom's Ground go like this. Mourn for the dead who died for this country, whose minds went dark at the edge of a field, in the muck of a trench on the beachhead sand, a blast amid ships, a burst in the air. What did they think of before they forgot us in that blink of time? before they forgot us. The glare and whiskey of Saturday evening, the drone or lilt of their family's voices, the bend of a trout stream, fresh made bed, the sound of a lathe or the scent of sawdust, the mouth of a woman, a prayer, who knows? Let us not force them to speak in chorus, these men diverse in their names and faces, who lived in a land where a life could be chosen, say that they mattered alive and after, that they gave us time to become what we could. Those are the lines that propelled me to get involved with this 20-year uh, pen pal relationship I had with Richard Wilbur. So I had been familiar with his name since the early 60s, having acted in professional projections of his masterful translations of Moliere plays, the misanthrope for which he won the first of two Pulitzer Prizes and Tartuffe. Those plays are written entirely in rhyming couplets in French. And the rhyming words in French don't translate to words that rhyme in English. So to find an equivalent word without changing the meaning of the original is a monumental task. Those are considered the definitive translations most others use in English-speaking productions. He had been commissioned to write a poem for the rededication of the Statue of Liberty, which he called On Freedom's Ground. It's quite a long poem set to the original music of composer William Schumann. The section of the poem and the inside of life consisted of only 16 lines, but they moved me deeply, and I just recited them for you. On the strength of this one excerpt, I looked up everything about his published poems. I purchased a book containing 250 of his poems entitled New and Collected Poems, for which he won his second Pulitzer Prize. After reading them all, I was so taken with them that I chose 20 poems from that collection to put together a 45-minute program that I entitled 
A Journey Through the Mind of Richard Wilbur. It begins with a poem about birth, then one on childhood, then adolescence, his war years, his wife, his four children, and other poems about his philosophy of life. I've been giving piano concerts at various retirement homes around the, the, um, the Los Angeles area and thought this would be a, another excellent diversion for the retirees. Writing to the publishers of the book, Harcourt Brace Ivanovich, I told them the poems I intended to use and asked about uh, royalty fees that I would need to pay to perform these poems publicly. I also included my credentials as an actor and mentioned my great admiration for Mr. Wilbur's work and that I acted in several productions of his Moliere translations. They wrote back $30 for each poem. However, there are three of the 20 that you've chosen that only Mr. Wilbur owns the rights to. We will forward your uh, letter with your request to his home in coming to Massachusetts. It's an end quote from the letter. Calculating $30 times 20 amounted to $600 for each public performance made my plans uh, prohibitive. I dropped the idea. These poems are so inspiring to me that while I was, would run around Central Park every other day, I would carry a few of his poems with me and eventually had all 20 memorized. I loved ruminating on these while I ran. About a week after I sent my request to Mr. Uh, Wilbur's publishers, I received the most beautiful letter from coming to Massachusetts from Mr. Wilbur himself. It goes like this, Dear Mr. Towie, Harcourt Brace's permissions people have forwarded to me your letter of 12 June in which you asked for performance rights for a number of my poems. I'm very happy that you wish to do a program of my work for retirees in Southern California. And you have my permission to make use of any poems of mine which suits your purpose and without paying any permissions fees. Many good wishes to you. Then he signed his name, Richard Wilbur, in pen. This letter is framed and has been sitting on my desk for a long time. We carried on a pen pal relationship on and off for the next 20 five years until he died at the age of 96 in the year 2017. I have many postcards from him and a few letters. These are all typed on the same old-fashioned typewriter. All the lowercase e's are filled with ink in the little half circle at the top of the letter. Since almost all of his poems appeared in the New Yorker magazine, before they were, they were compiled into one of his many published books of poems, he would often drop a line with a heads up to me saying, quote, this one, and he'd give the title of the poem and the date of the weekly publication before it appeared in the newsstands, quote, I think this one might suit your acting purposes. Again, feel free to use it if it fits your program. End quote. We never met, but I was always astounded and humbled that I was carrying on a correspondence with this giant in the literary world. Our wives passed away in the same year, 2007, both from complications of Alzheimer's disease. In, his, in this letter, which he wrote to me, and always on his personal stationery, with his name boldly printed in deep blue at the top, he would type his full Massachusetts address. Then, and this is the first time he addressed me, with my first name, it was always Mr. Towie. This time it's Dear John Towie. Now, when I wrote to him, I included um, a program for my wife's memorial service, which I'll show to you here. And um, I also, I don't have to show it to you, but I, I pretty well I will. I, I put in also a program of a, a recent piano concert that I had done shortly after she passed. Um, dear John Towie, the photograph on your wife's memorial program is utterly beautiful and full of life, and I'm honored that my little milkweed poem should be included. Now, he doesn't capitalize the word milkweed um, in his letter to me, but of course, it's always capitalized. I can't, I couldn't print it in the, uh, I couldn't print his poems in this book. Didn't have permission to do that, but I'll tell you this 
four line poem that covered just one page in the book. And the reason I included it was because my wife always left everything on the stage when she performed. She was a brilliant performer. And the poem goes like this. It's called A Milkweed. It's in the first person, just four lines. Anonymous as cherubs over the crib of God, white seeds are floating out of my burst pod. Oh, what power had I before I learned to yield? Shatter me, great wind, and I shall possess the field. That's the poem. Um, the program, together with that of your recent piano concert, tells me what a wonderful 30-some years you shared in the performing arts. I, too, am no longer a caregiver, my wife having died a few months ago. After 64 years, I am still warmed and cheered by her presence, but stabbed at times by her absence. No doubt your friends, like mine, advise you to, quote, keep busy. And I've been translating play after play of Cornier and hoping to be visited by poems. I send you many good wishes. And then, as always, he would sign his full name with a pen. When I decided to include his milkweed poem in Henrietta's memorial program, it was too late to write and ask his permission to use it. But when I sent the program to him, I apologized for printing it without asking his permission. Whenever I would sit down and write to him, before I could put pen to paper, and because he was such a giant in the literary world, I had to pretend that he hadn't won two Pulitzer Prizes, hadn't translated Moliere plays, hadn't written the lyrics to Bernstein's Candide, wasn't named Poet Laureate of the United States, and hadn't been the recipient of a myriad of prestigious poetry awards. I would have to say out loud to myself, quote, and now be honest, come on, just speak to him with your heart, end quote. There were three poems that used to start my heart when I would begin saying them. Quote, and I would say, why don't you tell him that, I'd say. So I did. He always was very kind in his responses. One of his poems, which again appeared in The New Yorker, called The Censor, a short eight-line poem, has such a surprise in the last line that when I read it, I began laughing so hard I fell off the kitchen chair as I was sitting on. I said to myself, quote, no, you can't tell him that. And then I'd say, yes, you can. Write to him and tell him. So I did. On a postcard, he wrote back, among other things, quote, I'm delighted with your response to the censor. Now, I read it once at the Great Quill, and nobody laughed. But I'm going to read it to you now. I couldn't print it in the Great Quill book, but um, I have it here. It's short. It goes like this. It's about someone like a critic, someone who criticizes the censor. In any company, he listens hard for signs of vanity and self-regard, reacting to each name that's dropped, to each complacent anecdote or turn of speech, with subtle indications of surprise. A wince, perhaps, a, a widening of the eyes, uh, or a slight lifting of the brow, addressed to the egomaniac within his breast. Now, I thought it was funny, but none of the great cool people thought it was funny. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you that. Oh. So, um, he was always very faithful and responding to anything that I'd write to him. Months would go by and I wouldn't write, but then when I did, within a week, I would always receive a card or letter from him. I was also thrilled to receive anything from him. The last postcard he sent said, among other things, quote, tell your retirees that at 95, I'm still teaching, but only one class a week, poetry on Friday afternoons at Vassar, end quote. An actor and poet living here at MPTF, Harry Northup, hi, Harry, approached me the other day in the library here on campus told him weeks before about my love of the poetry of Richard Wilbur, 
And um, there's something I want to skip here. Uh, but he, he wanted me to do it and Richard Wilbur's 100th anniversary at this place where he does stuff at Beyond Baroque. Uh, I, I, I never did it, but I intended to. Uh, thank you. I said that's a good, great idea. I would attribute to him. I'm going to try to arrange that. Never happened. It's been a couple of years since he's passed, but I still miss and will always miss the unusual and yet somehow personal relationship we had with each other. So that's the end of my Richard Wilbur piece. And I have another one here that um, is in, I think, the latest um, Great Quill book. And it's called, it's just called Simply Brando. From the time I'd chosen acting as a professional, I'd been very aware of Marlon Brando's work and had been an ardent fan. But I didn't become obsessed with them until the release of The Godfather and Last Tango in Paris, both released in 1972. I was the first in line at the first screening of Last Tango at a movie theater on the Upper East Side of New York. The film, along with The Godfather, sealed my unparalleled regard for him. He was 46 years old when he made both of these pictures. I had already become a strong admirer of his when he joined the March on Washington in 1963 with Martin Luther King Jr. And then when he became a serious advocate for the, the treatment of Native Americans in the early 1970s and his declining of the Oscar for his performance in The Godfather for castigating Hollywood, uh, castigating Hollywood in the way that they portrayed uh, Native Americans in film. The most influential movie critic in New York during that time was Pauline Kael, and her review of The Last Tango is one of the most renowned in the history of film criticism. It appeared in the New Yorker magazine on October 28, 1972. This is a quote from her review. Bernardo Bertolucci's Last Tango in Paris was presented for the first time on the closing night of the New York Film Festival, October 13th, 1972. That date should become a landmark in movie history comparable to May 29th, 1913, the night Stravinsky's Le Sacre du Printemps was first performed in musical history. There was not, no riot, no one threw anything at the screen, but I think it's fair to say that the audience was in a state of shock because Last Tango has the same kind of hypnotic excitement as the Sacre de Printemps. The same primitive force, the same thrusting, jabbing eroticism. Then parenthetical, not parent, but uh, ellip ellipsis. Bertolucci and Brando have altered the face of an art form, end quote. Time Magazine did a cover story on Brando that year, and I've never forgotten the first line of the article, quote, the king has returned to reclaim his throne, end quote. Before I moved to Los Angeles in 1990, I was cast in a film to be shot in L.A. I rented a room at the Highland Gardens on Franklin Avenue in Hollywood. Those were my marathon running days, and I bought a star map, found Brando's address, and on the days when I wasn't filming, I'd chug up Outpost Road to Mulholland Drive and then run six miles to Brando's home about a half mile west of Coldwater Canyon. I would rest on a rock across the street from his gated property, meditate, then run back to my rented room. During the years after moving here and the court trial involving his son, Christian, who, quote, accidentally shot and killed his sister Cheyenne's boyfriend, Dag Drolet, and then a few years later, when the same daughter committed suicide, my feeling for him as a father was seriously tempered. However, my admiration bordering on veneration for his talent never altered. I heard the news of his death on the radio on the afternoon of July 1st, 2004. Shocked, my first instinct was to send a sympathy card to the family expressing my deep admiration for him. I wrote a heartfelt note and decided to drive up to his home. I knew where it was. 
When I arrived around three o'clock that afternoon, there were three large television trucks parked on the shoulder on the side of the road, not far from his gated property. His gate consisted of a row of perpendicular bars that we could easily see through, though his home was not visible from the road. The gate was about 15 yards from the road. I parked on the shoulder near the trucks and I proceeded toward his mailbox. But as I stopped, uh, but I stepped onto his driveway, I saw his son, Miko, whom I knew but had never met, walk toward the gate. We met at the same time on either side of the gate. It looked like I was expected. Between the bars, I handed him the envelope, which simply said, the family, and I expressed my sympathy for his loss. He said, thank you, and turned and walked back. As I turned around, I was hit with a phalanx of cameras, lights, and microphones that were just thrust into my face. Quote, did you know him? One reporter asked, did you ever work with him? From another, the questions kept coming. Are you related to him? I shook my head no to each question. And when they finally stopped to hear my response, I took a deep breath and said, and from where in my brain this thought surfaced, I have no idea. But I do remember what I said spontaneously and slowly. Quote, he was my spiritual, artistic father. With that remark, all the lights turned off, cameras were turned off, microphones taken away. They all walked back to their trucks. I hadn't given them the sound bite they were, had been hoping for. When he passed that day, it felt to me like the end of an era. To many in the profession, he had redefined the craft of acting. In my opinion, quote, there's before Brando and there's after Brando, end quote. And to this day, that's the way I continue to feel. That's my essay on Marlon. Thanks, Harry, for asking me to do this. Thank you. I don't know, I don't know how long that took. That was wonderful. I always love your erudition and your personal relationship with Richard Wilbur. It's so loving and elegiac, and it was just marvelous what he said about your wife and what you said about your wife and also your your admiration and love of Brando as an actor and, and yeah. as you said, your spiritual uh, artistic father. And you're just so knowledgeable about poetry and also uh, acting. You've done so much great work as an actor. So I'm real uh, full of admiration uh, to you for this, uh, for your personal essays. How you know, is this part of, as you said in your bio, part of your autobiography? These two essays will go into it, yes. Now, are you when you do your autobiography, are you beginning at the very beginning when you were born, or how are? Yeah, I mean, about life? my youth, about my parents, my childhood, sure, um, and all that, all that, how I got into the business, and you know, my first job in New York, and uh, all of that, my years in the two years in the army in Puerto Rico, all that will be in the autobiography. Yeah. <laughs> What was your first job in New York City as an actor? What was my first job? In New York City as an yeah, actor. Yeah, I, um, I had driven a friend to Pittsburgh, and um, he had been hired for a year at the Pittsburgh Playhouse. And when I arrived there, helping him move, uh, I was asked, they were looking for a, a, a Dauntless in Once Upon a Mattress. So I, I was going to go back for a master's degree in directing to the Goodman Theater, but I thought, well, hell, I'll just try out. They wanted me. And so I said, can you hire me then for the full year? And they did after I got reviews for my Dauntless. But at the end of the year, the, the place folded. And one of the guys that had directed me was going to New York and trained as an agent. He said, if you come to New York, I'll send you around. Well, I met Stark Heseltine, his boss at the agency. And about a week after I met him, he sent me to an audition at NBC Studios at 30 Rock and I auditioned for a new soap opera. And I'd been in town for three months and I signed a three-year contract after three months. I, I was, I only, it only lasted six months because we were opposite as the world turns. We couldn't buck the ratings of that. So, But it was great. I learned about camera technique and I had about I had 70 episodes that I did in those six months. Yeah. So it was great. I loved it. 
and going to 30 rock every day, you know, and I was 27 years old, <laughs> couldn't beat it. Well, you started working pretty young and pretty uh, fast when you got to New York. What is what is the relationship that you have that you found out between your writing and your acting? The relationship between the two? I've never what is, even... What's something similar? What is something similar? How do you... Uh, how do you approach your writing as opposed to how you approach your acting? Well, my writing is is me. Acting, I'm always playing something. I'm now rehearsing for Felix Unger in The Odd Couple. And he's a very disturbed character. He's funny, but he's very disturbed. And it's it's not always a pleasant... It's funny, and it's funny to play it, but it's not the kind of character I. that's fun to sit in. Because he's so disturbed, you know. So, but how does it relate to my acting in me? Well, these are these essays are from me, and my memoir is going to be me. And acting, I was doing. I'm always playing somebody else. Well, but thank that's you. The only comparison much. I can really make, Harry. Well, thank you very much, John. I always love it when you come on this show, and you're you're doing fabulous work with your writing, as you have done in your acting. So. Thank you once again, John Towie, and I look forward to seeing you in The Odd Couple. Thanks, Harry. Thanks and so I, much. Thank you, John. And our next poet, or next writer, rather, is Ruthie yeah. Elliott. Emmy Award-winning animation artist Ruth Elliott drew pictures for studios like Hanna-Barbera, Warner Brothers, Disney, and others for over 27 years working on projects such as Scooby-Doo, The Simpsons, The Smurfs, The Jetsons, Space Jam, Fern Gully, The Tigger Movie, and many others. The mother of seven, she always aimed to inspire children and their parents. In 2008, she co-founded the nonprofit edudesigns.org to, quote, build brains and hearts through the arts, end of quote. An author and illustrator, her books include The Richest Kid in the Poor House, The Night Princess, Little Blossom, her art textbook, See What You're Looking At, and her upcoming Finding the Baby in the Bathwater. Here is the wonderful writer, Ruthie Elliott, reading a few excerpts from her latest book. Thank you so much. Harry, and I'm so excited to be here. Um, I know that uh, because this is an illustrated book as well as writing, at some points I will want to show some pictures. So um, uh, if if it's possible, I want to just test the uh, test to see if I can show any pictures. And it says share screen. Okay, good. Then I will do this and see if I can share it. Good. If you can see that, uh, that is that's the that's my my fur my sort of rough cover of my book. And as long as you can see that, then um, I thought it would be fun to show you one more little cartoon. This is uh, part of one of the uh, cartoons where I'm open it up and said, and it says, I finally got it all done. And there's <laughs> somebody who finally got it all done, right? <laughs> so anyway, so what I want to, um, what I'll do is I'm going to read some of these excerpts here from my book and, um, and I'll show you some more cartoons in a minute. Okay. So when each of my seven kids came down from heaven, they brought a little heaven with them, and, and with it questions. I would ask myself, is the love I have to give them really enough? Am I qualified to teach them? And why did I want so many kids again? <laughs> During those years of faithfully shoveling mud uphill each day, the biggest question became, God, what are you trying to teach me? <laughs> At first, I had imagined I was growing my children up. 
But as I began to understand, something else was developing. Me. Did I get it all done? No. (laughs) But everything is easier now that I've stopped trying so hard to save the world. How could I possibly do that when I couldn't even keep my own house clean? Through all the mistakes I made, I began to have compassion for how my parents must have felt. I'd never understood the depth of their love until I entered that secret society I call the Brotherhood of Motherhood. Something else emerged out of the muck and the grime, too. Joy. Once in a while, the kids would say funny things that would make me laugh and give me a bigger picture. As an artist and a cartoonist, an animator, I'd think, quick, write them all down so you don't forget. There was always more that I could record, but I'm glad I got a few of them down. Occasionally, one of my kids would ask me, Mom, get out the book of funny things we said, and we'd laugh like it was the first time. It was these close encounters of the family kind that taught me not to worry whether whether or not the kids would survive the chaos, but to accept all these surprise occurrences as golden moments of what life is all about. Was this some kind of divine equation? If my tiny speck of a universe could feel so much love for these quirky, smelly, whiny, loud, imperfect little humans through all of their shenanigans. Surely God, with his even bigger heart, should be able to accept me in all my failings, too. Maybe good enough was good enough after all. I was beginning to love myself. And I wanted to show <clears throat> some of the pictures that my kids that are going to be that, that my kids said um, funny things they said. And I'll share these images. This is when I was uh, one of my babies was kept sticking his foot into his mouth and sucking on his toe. And so I said, gee, I wonder if babies suck their toes when they're in their mommy's tummies. And she said, I did. That was all I got to eat. <laughs> that was my daughter, Lisa. And so I laughed and I said, uh, Oh, honey, you're so much fun to be around. And she said, what do you mean? I've been around myself all day and I haven't had any fun. (laughs) So let's see. There's something else I wanted to read. Um, There are some more cartoons. Let me put this one away for now. And then I will show. go to the next one. Okay. Number two, I think. Okay. So here we go. Now, um... All right, this is, okay, this is a memory. Okay, at six years old, one special word led to my past, led me to my past. On a hot day in Texas in 1955, my big sister stood outside under a tree, her nose in a book. I asked, what are you reading? An autobiography. What's an autobiography? That's when you write down your life story. I recoiled. What? You mean they're going to make me write it all down? But she ignored me and I asked her again. Well, are they? She walked away, leaving me to my imagination. I pictured myself standing exposed before a lofty tribunal, compelled to give an account of my entire life. What if I'd forgotten something? This was too important to mess up. I immediately sat down on the curb and strained my brain to remember everything that had happened to me in my whole life, including that day, the day before, and so on. I must recall everything. And in the weeks that followed, memories from earlier in my life began flooding back. And I eventually even remembered being born. So here's my birth memory. I was born stoned, panic stricken inside my mom. I knew I had to get out, but my heart sank. How can I fit through that tiny hole? I can't make it. I can't make it. Suddenly, the bright face of a wizened old man 
in a blue turban appeared in the dark, commanding me, you must make it. I felt myself surrender to my fate as my head squeezed through the narrow tunnel. I can make it. I am making it. And then, swoosh, I was out. A giant man picked me up. Why was he taking me away from that warm place I came out of? Terrified, as he took me into the next room, I kept asking myself, is he going to hurt me? Is he going to hurt me? I tried to see his face, but everything was going in and out of fo focus. I could smell his clean smock as my cheek lay against his chest, but all I could see was a little curly hair sticking out from under his cap and the pale green walls of the room. He lifted me up to look at me, and my eyes finally focused on his. His eyes were not mean. Whew, he wasn't going to hurt me. But I wanted that thing in the other room so badly. And I cried out to the giant, please take me back. But he didn't understand. And he laid me down in this little box. I watched helplessly as he turned and walked away. I wanted that warm place more than anything else in the world. How could he take me away from it and leave me here all alone? A flood of tears and a rainbow wave of dizzy, woozy feelings washed over my head as the room began to spin in confusion. What's happening? Oh, who cares? And I passed out. My mom had been given ether, which was a common anesthetic given to mothers during labor in those days. Unfortunately, it went straight through the placenta into the babies which is why some were asleep at birth and had to be held up by the ankles and spanked to get them breathing. But I was lucky. My mom had been knocked out and I was just stoned. <laughs> and I wanted to show you the pictures that I drew of this. Let me see if I could switch it real fast. Here we go. Okay, so here's the picture where the doctor pulls me out and I'm terrified <laughs> and I'm looking at him thinking, who is this giant? <laughs> and then there's this other one where, where I, I, he says, uh, I say, come back. Okay. So that's the one there. And the next part. Okay. Okay. I'll change it now to this one. Okay. So at around a month old, I woke to the sounds of people laughing in the other room. Wishing to hear what they were laughing at, I cried out, trying to get their attention. It was a great effort just to lift my head. Again and again, I called out. But when no one came, I fell back to sleep, exhausted from all that work. After a while, my mama did come in to pick me up. And I was excited. Finally, I'll get to find out why all those people were laughing. As she carried me through the dining room and into the kitchen, I observed that the house was cleaner than it, I'd ever seen it before. But all the people were gone. Had I missed out on all the fun? But my disappointment melted as she sat down at the table, held me on her lap, and smiled at me. My mom seemed so relaxed and happy. That was enough to satisfy me. So let me see. I've got the next one. Okay. Here we go. And this one is called, this, this little chapter is called In Their Shoes. So here we go. And um, so... Uh, many, many other memories returned as I kept trying and crying and learning what was expected of me, how to walk and how to talk and when to sit down and shut up. Though many of them have faded into obscurity since then, I've never forgotten how it feels to be a child. And the next section is called My Dream, My Mission. And I have to show you this little picture of when I was a little girl. That's me at around 
Oh, I guess I was around, uh, it must have been around seven or eight years old. And so anyway, here she goes. Um, with all these feelings of in, with these feelings of infancy and childhood flo- flooding back to me, I began seeing how every experience had affected my life going forward. My mom's example of kindness and understanding inspired me to want to make the world a better place. Walking home from the store with her one day, I questioned, should I be a doctor, mom? Doctors help people, right? Just then we heard two boys across the street and they were screaming words I could tell were bad words, but I'd never heard them before. Squeezing your hand tightly, I whispered, why are they doing that? She answered, Ruthie, it's probably what they hear at home. I was shocked. What? Don't their parents know that it'll make their kids do it too? What can we do to get people to stop acting like that? She explained, monkey see, monkey do. All we can do is try to be a good example and hope for the best. Our effect on others is kind of like the back of our head. We can't really see it. Then she added, prevention is the better part of cure. What does that mean, mom? She held up her thumb and finger an inch apart and said, and this is where I want to show you the picture. Again. Okay. And she said, it's kind of like if you just do this much work, with a baby. Then she stretched her arms wide apart and said, it'll do this much good when they're older. But if you wait until they're already teenagers and bend over backwards to help them, and then she returned her thumb and finger back to an inch, you'll only get this much for your effort. That lit up my seven-year-old brain. I saw that if people got what they needed when they were little, They wouldn't need as much fixing up later on. And I began to realize that there were other problems in the world besides physical ones. And I wondered if being a psychologist would be a better path to help the world. While thinking of all the work it would take to unscrew people's heads from all the bad examples around them, I thought, what if you could start new people out without all those problems? What if you could prevent them from getting broken in the first place? I imagined a world of loving individuals nurturing the next crop of new people that would initiate a ripple effect of kindness within each generation that would follow. It was clear to me that in the long run, raising children in a loving and high-minded way was the most effective way to elevate the world. Planting and nurturing the seeds of Good people who would do more good would eventually reach everyone, even if it took a long, long, long time. And I was willing and eager to begin the task. As a seven-year-old, it seemed a simple thing to change the world by starting people outright. I was eager and willing to do anything required of me to bring good people into the world, and I wanted a baby to practice on right away. I knew I was too little to have one myself, so I had to think of a way to get one. That night, I felt a strange urge to go outside and look up at the sky. An ache in my heart reached up to the millions of tiny lights above me in the darkness as a shooting star streaked across the sky. This was my chance to make the most important wish I could ever wish for. How can I get my baby? The answer came in a flash. If my mom gets pregnant, I'll get my baby. (laughs) Closing my eyes and taking a deep breath into my heart, I shot a wish for a baby, brother, up into the universe, and I left it there. Filled with the sweet certainty it would be answered, I went back into the house, and I told no one. A few months later, I noticed my mommy's tummy looking bigger. Are you getting fat, mom? With a low voice, she said, no, I think I might be pregnant. 
a thrill vibrated within me. Was that my wish coming true? Oh, mom, I'm so happy. But her head hung down low as her voice trailed off sadly. Well, I don't think your father is very happy about it. He wants me to have an abortion. Leaning forward, I asked, what's that? That's when they take the baby out, she said. No, I cried, you can't do that. Don't take the baby out, please. I'll do anything. I'll help you. Don't do it, mom, please. She bent down to comfort me. Don't worry, honey. I won't. I like kids and I didn't do it before when he wanted me to do it to you and your sister. Her words struck me in the chest. Papa had wanted me to be taken out too? And my sister? I adored my father. Didn't he love me? And then she added, and besides it's against the law, which it was in the 50s. Mom tried to make me feel better. It wasn't because of you, Ruthie. Papa didn't want kids because of the $350 hospital bill. But that made me feel even worse. Did that mean that money was more important than me? The crushing pain in my chest was more than I could bear. My heart withdrew into the empty space above me and I was left without any feelings. My mom and I never spoke of it again, but it was the core wound that changed my map of reality. It appeared to me that if they could get rid of you under the circumstances where you're either inconvenient, too expensive, or not useful in some way, I must determine not to be any of those things. I must always be an asset and not a liability in order to deserve to be here, or they might want to get rid of me. With my survival at stake, I relinquished my own needs and desires. I even found evidence to support my interpretation of what those of the events meant. When I would read Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I thought it was telling me I shouldn't want anything and to be happy with whatever I had. I didn't understand the word want was the word for poverty in the old English. It was telling me I would never experience poverty because a good father, like a good shepherd, looks after his sheep. But what does a kid know? Then when I'd read, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, I'd think, uh-oh, what if God wants me to die? And I'd think about it and I'd say, okay, God, I'll die if you want me to. But understanding would come later after I had kids of my own and realized that no good parent ever wishes ill for their child, but only wants the best for them. And I don't know how much time I have left. Oh, yes, I have a little time. Yes. Okay. So this one. Okay. Um, I have to show these these pictures because these are, this is cool. Let me see if I can find the little button. There we go. So finally, I'm a mom. And this is a picture that I drew at 16. I was trying to imagine what, what uh, Mary and Jesus probably really looked like because she was 14 years old when she had Jesus around that time, at least they, they estimate she was probably 14 years old. And, uh, and and seeing newborns like my little brother, I knew that they were really fragile looking and small and wimpy looking. So I imagined that. And so that's the picture I drew at 16 years old. And then um, so after the this is finally I'm a mom. So after the delivery of my own first child, my heart exploded with joy. Oh, you know what? I just missed something. There's another part. There's another one I was supposed to read about my little brother. Okay, here we go. Let me see. All right. Okay, this is the part I wanted to read because I hadn't had kids yet. I was still eight years old. Okay. So there we go. Thankfully, after my brother was born, my heart came back into my chest. Uh, because remember, it had just like vanished. I was just totally devastated and not wanting to feel anything. Okay. So 
um, after my brother was born, my heart came back into my chest, filled with love I had never known, and the joy of being helpful. Even when I was tired, whether feeding, rocking, changing diapers, or playing with him, I felt it was my duty to teach him everything I'd learned in my vast eight years of experience here on Earth. While carrying him around as a tiny infant, I identified and described the things that we saw around us. And when he started walking, I would guide him safely wandering through the house. Once when he tried to stick his finger in an electrical outlet, I shouted, no, honey, don't do that. There's dangerous stuff in there that could hurt you. His eyes bugged out, staring quizzically at those dark little holes in the socket. Years later, he would become an electrical engineer, possibly to satisfy that early curiosity. What is that stuff in there anyway? <laughs> His scientific mind was always stretching to create improvements on prior inventions. Once, coming out from under a table, he bumped his head and burst into tears, sputtering, When I grow up, I'm going to invent rubber tables. <laughs> Another time in the 50s, the only Band-Aids available were the pink white people variety. One day, as we sat cross-legged on the porch, he saw a black man walking by, looking it down at his pink Band-Aid, and then up at the man, he solemnly proclaimed, when I grow up, I'm going to invent brown Band-Aids for brown people. I was seeing my plan of changing the world one child at a time beginning to work. I knew how to change diapers, but what does an eight-year-old really know about changing the world? Yet, I had big dreams. Each day while walking home from school, I would try to imagine how many kids I could handle on my own. If they were all as intelligent, cooperative, and easygoing as my little brother, I could see myself with 13 of them. But if they were like some of the kids at school, the number would go down. Eventually, the universe would provide the lucky number. Fast forward um, I've, a few years. I was 11 when my parents sat us down to announce that they were getting a divorce. We protested in tears, but Papa said, would you rather we were happy apart or miserable together? There was a vacuum of information they didn't explain as we sputtered, I'm happy together. I went into panic mode. Was it my fault? I had only seen them fight once before. So in my mind, I reasoned, fighting must lead to separation. And I decided that going forward, I must never fight when I get married. But how could I make sure we wouldn't disagree? The safest way seemed through compliance. I would be the most agreeable person in the world, and then no one will hate me. Yes, that's what I'll do. So I continued on a path of pre-codependency by stuffing my own needs and preferences, going along to get along. Anyway, so um, I think um, what I should do is since we only have a few minutes, um, I wanted to show some of the cartoons and also show that last section of, uh, I wanted to read that little part that I started uh, sort of impromptu or prematurely earlier. Finally, I'm a mom. Okay. So after the delivery of my first child, my heart exploded with joy I never knew. Now, this was after I grew up and got married. As deep as the labor of birth had been, my heart soared in the opposite direction skyward. Gazing from the upper window of the hospital, I marveled at the multitude of people milling below. You mean each one of them had to come into the world this way? A vision of all the mothers throughout all time washing, washed over me in appreciation of each having labored in love to bring new life into the world. Then I noticed a homeless man searching through a trash can below. In my mind, I saw the little baby he once was 
his mother cradling him in her arms, the same way I treasured my baby. So precious we are. How could anyone ever want to harm even one of us after experiencing what it took to bring them into this world? Anyway, so um, I think I should show some of the funny pictures because we only have another minute. I want to show some of the pictures that um, I share in my book because I can't read it all, but there's lots more. Okay, so let me share. And okay, well, this was one time when we were so busy and uh, my, my, uh, <laughs> the busyness of life when you have all these kids. My, my daughter, Lisa, once the funny one said one day, Mom, the only time we ever spend together as a family is when there's an earthquake and we meet in the hall. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. She was amazing. Um, she still is amazing. And she also said this. She said, here we go. Mom, I made a Mother's Day card for you. Why is a mother so special? Who else would fish your toothbrush out of the toilet for you? <laughs> she was so funny. My gosh, she is so funny. She's still funny. She's the, She's a funny one. So, um, and then one of my kids, let's see, oh, I have to give a little bit for each kid. This is uh, one of my sons when he was a teenager. Um, he said, um, I'm not an optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm an I don't care a mist. <laughs> there we go. Yes, that's that was him. And then um, let's see, change. Okay. So, oh, this is a good one. This one here, another conversation between the three girls. They they all were uh, it, the old Annie was putting on makeup, and so the little Rebecca wanted to. Her name is Penelope. She wanted to do it too, and so the older one said, "Why'd you put so much makeup on? You look stupid." And the and Lisa said, "She doesn't look stupid. She looks just like you." <laughs> so anyway. Those smart things they said. And I think our time is up. My goodness. Are you going to have to stop me? Okay. I should stop here. And uh, in any case, um, I'll, I'll look forward to sharing the rest of the cartoons in the book when it finally comes out. <laughs> Thank you, Ruthie, for your loving, sagacious, joyful, and humorous, humorous writing your, and your superlative drawings. You have such a great memory. and. You're such a wonderful mother. You got it all done, Ruthie. Very nourishing. <laughs> and, also, <laughs> and I also like it that you're a visionary. You know, you really are a, a wonderful person, not only being a mother, but all your great work in your art and also your, your drawings and your writing. So thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to have you and John Towie on the show. And announcement before we go. Next Tuesday, the wonderful poets Dorothy Baresi and Jan Wesley will be with us. So thank you once again, Ruthie Elliott.